Welcome. I'm Laura Belmonte, the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences. And I can think of no more perfect way to start this event than by reading a poem. <laughs> this one's called The Dean. <laughs> Written by yours truly. Welcome to this celebration of meter, rhyme, and verse. Of all the poems you'll hear tonight, this will be the worst. <laughs> For I am not a poet, versifier, or bard. I do something much less hard. Mine is the world of meetings, budgets, and conflict resolution. Of problems, big and small, needing a solution. Where students, faculty, alumni, and staff vie for attention. Where writers, far better than me, come seeking a subvention. Of DAs, ICAT, FARs, and PNT, the Fed's acronyms got nothing on VT. <laughs> I am clearly no Giovanni, Merwin, or Cummings, so I'll leave the poetry to you and keep the college running. And with that, I'd like to introduce one of the most... <laughs> I'd like to introduce one of the most magnetic and inspiring people I've ever met, Nikki Giovanni. A few months ago, I helped introduce Nikki at her Virginia Tech retirement ceremony. It was an evening to celebrate her wondrous career at our university. I stood before a room full of authors, educators, musicians, and former NFL athletes eager to honor and spend time with Nikki. I listened as friends and fans of Nikki expressed how she helped shape the trajectory of their lives and with her honesty, wisdom, and passion. Amid the happy tears, the hearty laughs, and the snapping of group selfies with Nikki and Ginny, one thing remained clear. Nikki is, and always will be, a hokey at heart. And this poetry prize is, and will always serve, as a powerful symbol of the everlasting impact of Nikki Giovanni on this magnificent university. She helped grow our award-winning MFA program that now attracts poets and authors from across the nation and globe. And she continues to embody our motto of ut prosum by serving students in college uh, and the college in a variety of ways, including tonight. Without further ado, please welcome University Distinguished Emerita Professor Nikki Giovanni. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I'm, I'm delighted with this award. This is our 17th year of the, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, I'm so pleased. And thank you all for coming because as a, I'm a Jeopardy fan. And as they say, you know, if without you, there is no Jeopardy. So I'm glad that you've come. We don't have a problem, but we do have a situation. And one of the situations is as we have begun and grown, we have needed to extend. We were able, we are able to extend, and we have a partner now with Artemis. And Artemis is by Jerry Rogers. I know Jerry's there someplace. There she is. And we are going to publish the poems, the top three poems in Artemis. We're going to publish them in Artemis so that our students can begin to learn what it is to publish. And we're very proud to be a part of that. Artemis started out with Ann Weinstein. And Ann was right here, was a local Amer Appalachian, and then we've grown. Uh, Jerry has a partner which, take, which goes all the way to um, Arizona. So we are reaching out. I think, and I'm not a mean person, but I think it's important that we be number one. And so, <laughs> I do, I get sick of it. Well, it's okay. No, we want to be number one. And in order to be a national, we have to have a national view. And in order for that to happen, we have to keep reaching out. So I, I am hoping that we continue, not just to grow, but that the university continues to take the pride in this award that we did. We know if it snows, 
we all enjoy sitting inside and watching the snow fall. If it rains, we all put our hoods on and we can go out in the rain. We know if it's cold, we have to put on a coat. We know if it's hot, we take off some clothing. What we have to remember, that's just a bad way of saying, is that everything needs something. And in order for this prize to be what it needs to be, because we want it to be a national prize at some point, it has to have somebody to run it. Now, I have what they call retired. And <laughs> that's what, every time you pick up your phone, somebody says, not, since you're not working. But I, I cannot try to run. I, cannot, I can no longer run this. Our dear friend and good partner, Eileen Murphy, has been running the, the Giovanni Steger poem in the, for the last five years. It is a lot of work. And in running this, she has to take, if it was snow, she'd have to, she'd have to move it up. So we want her to have a shovel. And the shovel for her to have would be a class off. And I know somebody says, well, Nick, you know, no, we didn't come here to hear you talk about things like that, but somebody has to. If we don't find somebody with a class to take time off to be able to run this prize, we won't get these wonderful youngsters here. We won't get you here. We won't be able to grow and be what we're going to be. If Virginia Tech values us, they have to give us the time. We are the soil, and we have to find a way to make us grow, to let us grow. Eileen has been our gardener, and we have to continue to let her. I, I told her, I'm not trying to embarrass Eileen, but it is important for us to think about it. I am so glad to see you all, but there should be more of us. And there are not more of us right now because more of us didn't know about it because more of us weren't aware of what we were doing. So we're here for the kids, and we're here for those of us who know and love us. But a lot of people would be here who know it. We have 60,000, 80,000 people come for our football games because somebody talks about our football games. Somebody says, oh, the football, well, football went so much this year, but <laughs> the basketball team has been really doing well. I really like that. And the girls are number nine. I'm just trying to say, to the dean, as I have said, to the president, and we usually have with us here the provost, we, if we value this, we have to make sure that we fertilize the soil. And we're going to only be able to do that if we put the time in it. It's, it's important. Normally, for those of you who are not with us all the time, normally we have faculty. We have the students read and then the faculty, and students read and then the faculty. Almost all of the faculty has retired. We're all old. I'll be, I'll be 80 in six months. So we have all gone to old folks' home. We all live in Walmart or something. <laughs> That's the truth. So it's important that we bring the new faculty, the younger people in. And I would point out that the first person to win the Steger Prize, was a, his name was Bryant, was a physics major. And all of the English kids got upset because they said, how come a physics major won our prize? And I said, because he writes better than you. <laughs> That's true. But it's not a question of departments. It's a question of our students knowing that we want them because it is an undergraduate award. We are now at $1,500, which we thank Dennis Treachy particularly for, but we are, and his wife, but we are at $1,500, which, as some of you may or may not know, England, that England, the one in, not, not Oxford, in Mississippi, because they're cheap, but England heard about us for a lot of reasons that we had a prize, and they matched our prize, and we were $1,000 then. And I went over to see Dr. Steger, and I said, you know, Dr. Steger, they, they have a thousand pounds, which is not a, a dollar. Pounds worth more than a dollar. And he just looked at me because he's sick of me anyway. He's like, what do you want? I said, I want us to make, I want to be better than England. And even though we speak the same language, we don't. We speak American, they speak English. And if you never talk to an English person, you know exactly what I mean. I wanted us to be number one. And I still do because we have bright students. We have creative kids. We are doing so much in engineering. We're doing so much. And poetry is a part of the comfort of this campus and the so much that we do. 
It's a part of the love that we do. It's a part of the choice, the chance that these youngsters take because a lot of people are, are afraid. Oh, if I send my poem in, what if they don't like it? And so they're learning now, who gives a damn what they like? What we like is the fact that we are creative and that we are going to do something and that we're going to make this. I want, I don't, you know, you don't ask the Lord for a lot. I don't ask the Lord for a lot. First of all, he don't pay no attention to me or there would be peace in the world and we'd all be rich. But <laughs> I won't pick on the Lord right now. What we really want, or what I really want, is to see this become a national prize. And we can't do that until we let it grow. And so Eileen's sorry that she invited me here. The dean is sorry that she, was <laughs> that she had <laughs> to be bothered with me here. But I'm saying this to all of us. We have to work on this. And we have to find a way to let someone run this so that people will know about it. And that's what's, that's what's important. And we have to let our students know how proud we are. Because every engineering student that does something that's in the front page of the newspaper, ooh, look, he made a car. You know, and you get sick of that. I want to say, ooh, look, someone wrote a poem. You don't see that in the paper. You don't see that in the fur trade. You don't see their little smiling faces. And I don't know why. I don't know why it is you have to hurt somebody in order, that's not news, that's crap. News is when you can sit down and put some words together and someone can smile and someone can say, oh my goodness, look at what we've done. That's news to me. And I'm so proud of these youngsters, a couple of whom I taught, one of whom I know kept saying, I'm, I can't write, I can't write, who is a beautiful writer, I know that, who will go on to be a, a great writer. I'm so proud to be a Hokie because the Hokies are good people. We have to continue to let the world know how proud we are to be Hokies. So I thank you for putting up with me thinking about that. And I thank you for being with us tonight to cheer us on because it's, 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 you are very scared. I am, when I get up to say something, I'm scared, say, oh, somebody's gonna walk out on me. And then I thought, well, hell, let them walk. You still have to say what you have to say because words, you will know, are all we have. And if that's all we have, then we have to use it. So I thank you all for being with us and sharing, and I thank you for sharing your words. So you guys, um, I'm gonna say this, but when you all go in alphabetical order, you'll just say your, and just say your name before you read your poem, that's all. Um, Oh, yeah, yes, exactly. Hello, um, I'm Eileen Murphy. I'm the director of this prize. Um, oh, sorry, we left a mess up here, you guys. <laughs> um, I wanted to say the students are not getting introduced individually, but they are coming in alphabetical order in, in line to do this, and they will say their names. Um, and so if you want to take pictures and stuff, you can come closer. Um, thanks for being here. Okay, and we're starting with Kayla. Oh boy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kayla. Um, my poem is called Seaweed Green. My favorite color used to be seaweed green until pointed eyes and pointed questions made me hate seaweed green. Until their pointed eyes and pointed questions questioned whether I was worth enough to be their friend, whether half of me could be buried beneath half of my ancestors, beneath rice fields and soybean plants, to see if the zipper on my head was invisible enough, whether my mother tongue was quiet enough. I used to send black and white notes through reeds and lips and teeth with willing calluses on my thumbs until my reed broke until my read broke one day when an eighth grade girl decided to say, I was only good because of who I was and not what I'd done. When she decided to take the chink in my armor and crack it open until I was vulnerable. When she decided to say that half of me was worth all of me and all of me was worth only half. I am a pale yellow girl like saffron mixed with half and half. A pale yellow girl whose favorite color used to be seaweed green. Thank you. Hello, my name is Calvin and the title of my poem is Sleep Evades Me. 
At the end of the arduous evening, I lay my head to rest. Time is gelatinous. My body is frozen, my mind electric. I count to 10, then to 1,000. I breathe in four counts. I see the oxygen become absorbed by my lungs as I hold my breath for seven. Not can yet, I slip into a more relaxed state as I exhale for eight. Crash, bang, pow, terror grips my frame now. I rush to the door of the apartment to find it locked. Sigh, the police won't be breaking in tonight. Back in bed, the terror lingers and haunts me, a weary sleeper. In my slumbers, I see my father strangle a man for his own good because God told him to. My hair falls out in great clumps in the shower. They say it's from stress. They say it happens to all the volunteers. Why then don't they do anything about it? I feel his presence behind me. I scream. His hands bruise my shoulders while his mustache tickles my neck. I don't feel the hot tea spill across my hands. My stomach aches, so I make a bout de brod. Toast a little bread with some kielbasa and sear, a grilled cheese for the 4 a.m. warrior. As I finally fall back asleep, the 6.30 alarm tells me to go for a run. Quickly, I obey. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Reed Burton, um, and this poem is called The Lake Isle of Tennessee. <clears throat> Sometimes I sit and think about a chilled river north of the paper mill where we skipped math class on warm green days and swung from a worn rope on a splintering tree before John's dad got laid off and it all went to hell. Where we used to sneak six packs <clears throat> and night long girlfriends and where Ryan's older brothers taught us more than the public schools ever did. Where we burn our lungs and widen our eyes, wondering if the lovers initialed in the oak tree are still happy, and where Andrew tried to kiss Sarah but ended up giving her a bloody nose instead. Where we'd run from the union cards and factory lines, laughing at the drowsy eyelids of our fathers and fleeing the uncolored thoughts of the enclosed and encircled life of a worker. Where a purple twilight would cover the mountains like something living, and we would glimpse the beauty of this dark valley and find some peace there. Sometimes I sit among ordered desks in offices gray and think about how that river twisted and turned back towards the start. How that factory line looks better with a baby and no high school degree, and those once priceless hours are now worth $14.50. About how affectations became habits which became fiery tumors, how the toxins and spirits that once opened our hearts now dull our eyelids, and how we became everything we once ran from. Sometimes I sit and think about how my cabin of clay and wattles is not here, but in those lost hours by that riverside. Parents brown liquor in a water bottle and reverb happiness from a slow dying Bluetooth speaker. With the only family I ever got to choose, swimming low in that quiet, desperate river. Sometimes I sit and think of the chaos of those youthful spring nights and feel peace in my heart's core. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ira, and this is the glass door in my kitchen. It never opens right, because if you push too hard, it makes the door tilt on its corner and hit the wall. But I would sit in front of it on the more orange than brown fake wood tiles and hear the whirring of the razor as my mom would complain that my brother was demanding too much of his fine hair. <laughs> I'd laugh to myself and let the sun burn my toes, my calves, my thighs, and if the AC was especially chilly that day, my face too, the yellow rays creating shapes on my body. I would study the dirt crammed in the slits where the door would slide, stare at the lime green plastic button jammed in the corner, the one I used to take around with me because I liked the color and thought I lost, though now it lingers, accompanying me in the light. I'd see the bright blues to the crosshatch screen and take in the heat ruminating on the similarly orange deck toasting the chair, the table, the grimy, grungy grill, where numerous salmon have given their lives to feed the hungry gluttons behind that glass door in our kitchen, which could hardly contain the beats of old music and the stories of work and the shouting demands to set the table and the hearty, explosive laughter of myself and of us. Thank you.
Hi all, I'm Amelia. Uh, this is Strawberry Plains. I think of you every time the shorter strands of hair fall forward and of how you want me to cut them back again. And I think sometimes of how much we've changed and how little we have in common now and how little we had in common then. But it was always enough and I hope that it still is. But my memories of you aren't thoughts of changes. They're pancakes on the breakfast table dolly in H2O, three to a bed, and homecoming pictures on your front porch with the colonel joking, where's the rest of your dress? My memories of you are that you're the first heartbreak I saw in real time, and you saw mine. You saw mine, and I saw yours, and it cycled, and it's cycling still, but we're quiet for the moment. My memories of you are a stolen phone in an interrogation, three to a bed like in the eighth grade, trying to figure out if the guitarist down the street who borrowed my books in the summer liked me, and my smug smile and nacho fries a lifetime later, and how good things were, and how we heckled you, and how wrong we were about the boys of yesteryear. I remember how my sister loved you, and how pleased my mother was when we became friends, that I finally had a girly friend, and I remember that you were the first person to ever do my makeup. I remember your dogs and how I hated your sister and us locked in my room with my brother and a Nerf gun on the other side of the door. I remember hot chocolate on Halloween and avoiding almost every house because you were embarrassed to know them and still be trick-or-treating at 14. I remember dancing in the basement of the rec building and a pads versus tampons debate in the coffee shop and I remember that you're still the only person I've ever let crack my back and I remember that I didn't like you at first. And I think of in the spring, how you asked me to call more often, and how I don't think I did, but of how we talked in the midsummer when I'd slip out of the house to walk in the heat, and of how you taught me what feminine friendship is. I think of you every time the shorter strands of hair fall forward, and of how you're the only girl I'd cut my hair over a boy for, and I think mostly of how I love you all my life long, no matter how we or the years have changed, and of, how, and of donuts on a dawn walk leaving you and the bricks behind. Hi, I'm McKenna, and this is Red Unread. I used to hate when people would bend books or write in the margins or dog ear pages. Now I've found myself falling in love with the way people read the words of others. Sometimes they want to record their thoughts alongside the author's thoughts and write in between lines or in colorful sticky notes from Office Max. Sometimes the pages would be bent in the corners to mark someone's forgotten place in a book because they lost their favorite bookmark with a red tassel and never bothered to buy another. I've come to love the stain oil of sunscreen on a hardback without its cover. I used to hate it, bringing my books to the beach and there being grains of sand in between the pages and the ocean humidity folding the pages of my book back without permission. Now it's some kind of art. The words inside the pages are forever alongside the many lives they've lived, told by the reader's habits. I tell my dad whenever he borrowed a book of mine, don't write on the pages, please, because he so often did his own. Now I wish his scratchy handwriting and instant reactions to each paragraph had decorated the page, so pen ink thoughts could remind me of how he used to see the world. I told my friends, don't bend the pages, without realizing a bend meant more than a scar on a book. Now I wish I could have seen where they stopped and picked up again and wonder. Boredom, time constraint, reflection, I cringed whenever high school teachers would encourage us to annotate alongside our reading. My pages remained blank, looking as if they were unread and freshly printed, when I knew they were quite the opposite. How beautiful it would be to create a version pre preserving of myself like pressed flowers between covers. I began to feed my voice back into the pages, learning about myself in between the spaces and words, illustrating them with my pen marks as if these books were a canvas for my mind and the authors my muses. The liberty to be messy is what grants us creation. Hello, hello. My name is Caitlin Gruby, and I will be reading a poem called Softer this time. I'm very tall, hang on. <laughs> Softer this time. What would happen to my house plants after the apocalypse? Would they sit there, waiting, swaying toward sunlight through shuttered blinds, withering away, wilting in the same pots where they first grew? What if there's nothing after? Fire, then wind, vibrating in death's crooning voice, sweeping its barbed arms over all the green, leaving only shadows on the wall. 
Why does the end of the world have to be so violent? What if the flowers leap from their pots? A thousand eyes stem from stamen and syncopation. Music remains, of course. Leaves rubbing, humming. Morning dew is rosin on a violet bow. Dust becomes lush with lilac fields spreading. Wasn't the Callan show on my windowsill supposed to stay small? About the size of an open palm, but it just keeps growing. Would it ever stop with no one left to quell its ambitions? It has already outgrown three pots. Maybe it will never be satisfied. Leaves become riverbanks and petals mountain tops, but because it isn't human pride, it doesn't recognize itself in time. Would it grow until it swallows the world and eats away all the oxygen and consumes itself and maybe self-destruction isn't only a human phenomenon and, well, damn it, I made it sad again. Let me think, what would happen? My name is Joe Hughes III, and I'll be reading I Die on Your Screen. I die on your screen and reanimate through digits. You didn't see my neck on the curb. Do you see it on your feed? It snaps through burnt pixels while your veined eyes glance from carcass to carcass. Record minds see you like dark skin. Sometimes the best porn captures subjects still. You'll find gashes if you stare. My smirk of their crimson. Do you see me when you scroll? I watch you tap my skin twice. My dead, my blank retinas gaze and saw the same dead eyes watching a thin box. Pacification for the board. Did you see me that day? Watch me scream when you tap me. Might kill your passivity and confirm some stereotypes. Check this. <laughs> How many dead black folks does it take to resurrect a new trend? Sometimes I cry, so, I cry so hard, I laugh when you cry. Did you find yourself in my shoes yet? You'll find me in obituaries and poems, but you'll only see me alive when you stop watching me die. My name is Rowan. This is Doing and Undoing. Every shade of morning the world could pull from its pocket, I spent with the slipping mirror trying to recognize myself. My grandmother's voice reached through the phone with desperate hands, my beautiful granddaughter. I sobbed with my head on the steering wheel, thinking of the man on the TV who didn't believe his foot was his. August heat pressed a pillow to my mouth. There was not enough time before work to take the dress off. He begged them to cut it off in the middle of the ER. They wouldn't. My stepmom marched around and took down each slip of paper I had placed on my face and asked me why I wanted to hide. Beautiful is not supposed to mean beautiful, but I love you and you deserve to be here. In sixth grade drama, I ran lines until my voice gave in. I just wanted to be good at things. To be a girl is to be hurled down the slope towards woman. You learn to scrapple and slice yourself on rocks with grace to survive a landslide. There is no time to ask who started it. To be a woman is to be useful to someone else. I can sew so nicely that you'll never know I'm wearing someone else's skin. There are no seams. The play is not a play if it never ends. I am haunting my own body. The exorcisms never work. I won't listen to the Catholic Church on this or on anything. I have always watched myself in my dreams, hovering over my shoulder as I speak and laugh and die and the dream keeps going without me. I've never been good at unblurring the signs by the interstate. By the time my friend says, look, it has morphed back to trees, my head still turns, hands on the steering wheel. You talk to the empty chair, you try to speak her back into being. The name slips into my muscle like a needle, pushes down on my inhaling lungs, jumps onto the hood of my car. It slices neat and quick down the stomach, always searching for some kind of beginning. As I make us tea, I cry in the kitchen and love you for trying. I look so different now, yes. But the door broke open into the cold wind as I left the court, and I caught my reflection in the window, a body real and still, with hands cradling paper from the wind's grasp. And for a moment, I paused.
Hi, my name is Truthy, and my poem is called Refugees in Martha's Vineyard, after Carolyn Forche. Here is the torture of glass days under the hell of summer, of uncovered mass graves and refugees in Martha's Vineyard, of women who pay a price and writers who lose an eye, of collapse and turning and widening. Somehow, still, there is no other way to say this. There is no other way. It always coils back into your ugly hands. Whoever you love, however you repent, it lines your nail beds in soiled, soiled crimson. And good luck spending the rest of this lifetime, this tragic, doomed, inconsequential formality falling before God, begging to be washed clean. If your God was here, he would say, nothing can be done, and wipe the tears from his feet. Thank you. Hi, my name is Naya Nesbitt, and I'll be reading Fifth Chair. I stiffly sit in a cold aluminum chair designed specifically for violinists and make sure to sit on the edge of the seat and adjust the sand, the black metal clanging as I place down my bow and the orchestra waits for the conductor's cue. A hush falls against the crowd as he lifts his sweaty hand and signals to her, the first chair, the best player. Her bird-like wrist lifts her straw to the nook of her chin, and her rosin brush bow blonded in her hair to the third string, and plays a note so clear the wailing child somewhere in the crowd pauses to listen. My hands start to sweat from nervousness or the beaming white light so bright that I can't tell its placement in the ceiling. And I look over to the person next to me, but they are staring at her, mesmerized by her talent. My back starts to hurt and my shoes start to squeeze my feet and I start to remember when my mom asked why I didn't practice anymore and why I didn't make it into a chamber and why I didn't want to take lessons. As she plays her A string, each section leader follows suit, tuning their cellos and violas and basses and the notes surround me and begin to suffocate me, sucking the air out of me, making my eyes brim with tears. I lightly pick up my $20 bow that rested on the stand and place the darkened horse hairs in the A string and follow, as I always have. Hi, my name is Grace Turner, and this poem is titled Intrauterine by Design. <clears throat> and God said, you may stop seeing now. And I did. And God said, you may be feeble, you may be sick, you may find yourself a grocery clerk bagging bulk nuts and dried fruit and then find yourself on the ground looking up like a seabed, a fluorescent halo around your high school coworker's head, water all around you. You may find yourself having dreams about illness and death. You may begin to find crows everywhere, but all this is, all this is very unlikely. And I said, God, I have a prayer. I have a prayer excuse me, freedom from the gonads, freedom from the pill, from hormones, from soft plastic and string, from insertions and deletions, from probes, from aliens. Always there is the promise of no more pain, no more blood, the promise that I'm stupid not to want that. I wish I hadn't believed, and God, I have a prayer that I think you should answer. I want bloodshed, like an accessory. Find a pair of jeans I hate or love, then let my body love them some more. And God, I want to wear them. I want everyone to know. And God said, you're not the first. I said, I know, I hope not. And God turned off his headlamp and God said, Let's wait a few more months. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joshua, and this is The Drawing Night. Black masses 
of mountain flesh upheave on all sides, simmering with the toad chorus. The stars emerge from their burrows, the tapetum lucidum of their existence, peppered across the cosmos, reflects on a mountain field in Virginia. The song of oven birds hangs like fog until morning, while the field sparrow is awake like me, singing into the wonder of the night, this drawing night. It calls forth all the light that is not our own, the rubies of whippoorwill eyes by porchlight, the shimmering of ascendant insects and glowworms parading in the grass. Foxfire fruits rise like green flames from coals of rotting oak and speaking into the curtain, seethe softly, the darkness is complete. Thank you. Not that tall, so. <laughs> All right, uh, hi, my name's Maria, and I will be reading Bunu. My grandfather visits us every spring, always up the next day working in the garden, weathered skin tanned from years of farming, a smile on his face, never resting. Up the next day working in the garden, showing me how to hybridize roses, watching his old hands tie together the knots that bind the roses of our relationship. Nails cracked and caked with dirt, the smell of cigarette smoke clings to his vest. A haze that follows him from Yugoslavia to Austria, New York, and back again. He taught me and my siblings chess, our multiplication tables, and the habit of watching the news. He picked up the English language in New York, the sounds falling around him as he works. Janitor of a nightclub, superintendent of his building, interacting with everyone around him, a smile on his face. With his growing family, he returns to his old life, to his old country, back to his life of farming. He tells me these stories as I grow up, teaching me how to dance, as his voice sings la la la, my baby brother bobs to Romanian music, his two-toothed smile a mirror of the man holding him. He spends every day outside working in our yard, making it look like a palace garden. He cuts down branches from our pine, swinging from the tree in his 60s, something I'll never be able to do. He speaks to my mother in Romanian. Their words a current that drags me down, listening to the speedy syllables. I don't know what they say, but I know enough words to understand the most important. Where are you? About the kids. Lord have mercy. And most importantly, where's the bread? Everything is better with bread and a potato, adding substance to our chemical and familial bonds. During 2020, he bought an accordion, 20 pounds, 120 buttons. The hiss of air as he breathes life into it with his shoulders, showing me the songs that his father knew. He departs. When he returns the next time, I've learned all the songs. As I show him, he keeps smiling, his eyes glistening with tears of memory. And together we play through the past towards the future. Thank you.
Um, I was going to ask uh, at the beginning, and I forgot, to um, for the committee who read all of these poems and chose these amazing poets, if you were in the audience, would you please stand up? I see you there, Lucinda. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Thanks, Sharon. Yes, yes. It's an amazing amount of work, and it was, it's the most fun committee ever to be on. There's amazing, lovely people. Um, okay, so you're going to read stuff. Um, i got to figure out how to do this. Okay, I'm going to show you what this looks like. The, um, we, we don't have our usual kind of award made by the lady... Um, Capone. Capone. Faith Capone. Faith Capone. But um, what we do have is patterned after how she made it um, with the help of Virginia Tech students making these at the foundry here on campus for students, students making the, the awards for students. So, um, and you can look at it and pose with it, but you can't take it home until we take it and get it engraved for you. Okay, so, all right. So. Um, That's pretty. Yeah, yeah, it's heavy. Oh, it is heavy. It's heavy, so it's a good paperweight. Yeah, you get okay. mad at somebody, just smash them in the head. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> Nikki, you, oh, actually that, um, actually I'm gonna say the name, um, the, the, all the top three winners will receive one of these, um, a commemorative sculpture cast by Virginia Tech students at the Material Science and Engineering Foundry at Virginia Tech, led by Associate Professor Alan Drushitz. Yeah. So thanks to Alan and his students. And we did this. Okay. So this is for you to read down starting here. Okay. So up here. So come close. Oh, we had a tie for, for third place. For third place. Um, Rowan and um, Kayla. Oh, Rowan. Rowan. Oh, Kayla. Rowan. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, wait, wait, <laughs> wait, wait. Didn't somebody do that at the Academy Awards? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> wait, should I be up here? No, no, no. It's Kayla, actually. Kayla. It's Kayla. Oh, okay. Yeah, it is okay. Kayla. That's right. It's, it's fine. I have the confusion. Okay. Um, Rowan. And also, the other thing, can you read the rest of what it says there? The third place winners are Rowan Lacey for Doing and Undoing, and Kayla Beret. Bure is a French, mm -hmm. okay. Uh -huh. And Kaylin Bure for Seaweed Garden. Uh, and and um, the, the third place winners are both getting the whole amount of $500. Yeah. <laughs> you know why? Because we're number one. <laughs> okay. Do they both get it? They don't they, both they, get it. Yeah, they all do, actually. Oh, great. There you go. So. The second place winner I should read that, who will receive $800. The second place winner is McKenna, McKenna de Torres for Read and Unread. So, Congratulations. Yeah, so we'll, give you, we'll pose with this afterwards. So. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you, oh, thank you, Congratulations. Okay. Here's your first place. So say the amount and everything. There you go. This is the first place winner. Yeah. Our first place winner is Josh Reward for The Drawing Night. Thank you. Congratulations, Josh. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> and all of it winners will receive a copy of Artemis. They, they have. And they have. And I hope that you will consider as you go on to continue writing. I know both of you, and you should. As you continue, I hope that you'll consider sending it in and, and pointing out that you were one of the finalists. Finalists is good. And also the, um, the top three are going to be published in this year's yes. Artemis yeah. um, with uh, the new partnership with Artemis. Um, thanks to the Jerry. lovely, <laughs> lovely Jerry Rogers. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so 
that I'm going to hand the rest of these out to people and we are going to have them take some pictures with Nikki and we invite all of you to join us for the reception in the lobby. You can stay here and watch the pictures or you can head out there. It's all up to you. And, and thank you. And I have you. a very short poem. Oh, you forgot to read that. Yeah, oh, read you think I should read it now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a toast to poetry. Oh, oh no. Uh, they may have, there's a game. It's seven o'clock. Oh, okay. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> we need a poem sometimes because we are lonely. We need a poem because we sometimes have lost our way. We need poems because the dog is in the yard barking at the neighbors and the soup is boiling over and we are sick, we are, uh, we are thinking I'm sick of earth. I'm going into space to find another life. We need poems because they tell us we already have a wonderful life here. We raise our glasses for all how the wonderful poems for how wonderful it is, excuse me. Let's raise our glasses for how wonderful it is that points take such good care of us. I like that. Thank you. But there is a game at seven. I know some of you. So where's Leslie? That's the question. Oh, there you are. Oh, hi. Oh, Leslie is you're this. Leslie. Hi, Leslie. <laughs> Okay. And I do thank all of you for coming out. And you can see, my I lost my glasses in one of the hotels. I've been on tour. And I left at some ungodly hour of the morning without my glasses. And so you can see what's happening. I'm, I, can't, I, <laughs> I can't see. And I haven't had time to go get glasses. So then I'm supposed to know something so I don't need my glasses, but I do. But my friend Jenny reads, uh, what is that thing, a Kindle. And so she doesn't need glasses because she can make her, her things bigger. But I read from paper and it won't grow. <laughs> so that, that's what happens to that. But I do thank you for putting up with me tonight. Thank you very much.